Hey everyone, let's discuss food allergies and food reactivity, and more importantly, what you can do to fix it. Welcome to Dr. Rusho Radio, providing practical, science-based insights into health, exploring the importance of nutrition, lifestyle, and gut health through conversations with experts, research reviews, and personal stories. We break through the bias and the noise to bring you simple, trustworthy information that matters. Thankfully, there are really two items that underlie most food reactions. So if we can target those with effective therapeutics, we can improve this reactivity. I should draw one important distinction, which is the technical term of food allergy means something that is IgE mediated and is more of what you would expect with a anaphylactic or a serious, potentially life-threatening reaction. What I'm referring to in this video are for people who have sensitivities and intolerances. So you eat a food and you notice brain fog or low mood or that you feel generally tired, maybe joint pain, skin reactions, reflux, bloating, indigestion, constipation, maybe even diarrhea. It's this sort of thing with technically what's referred to as sensitivities and intolerances that I want to help share with you today the two underlying components that cause this, and then correspondingly, the couple treatments that are the most effective in remedying this. And this is something I see a lot of and and my clinical team, we work a lot with. So getting people to a point where they can expand their diet and eat more foods is a huge win. Just to circle back for one moment to the symptoms that might indicate you're having a reaction to foods, they're pretty broad. So there are digestive symptoms. This would be the obvious. I eat a food, I feel burpy, gassy, bloated, full, have loose bowels, that sort of thing. But there's also a systemic, and this is where the foods may not cause a problem in the GI per se, but can lead to other sort of global or systemic symptoms. And this is where we see things like fatigue, low mood, brain fog, skin issues, and perhaps even joint pain, just to name a few. And when we summate this all out, it leads to one of these two factors that I think we should really focus on, which are either the development of leaky gut or the development of of imbalances in the gut microbiota. With leaky gut, this is damage to the lining of the gut, which is problematic for twofold reasons. Firstly, If you damage the lining, the lining is actually in part responsible for production of enzymes that help you digest food. And if there's too much leakage, that excessive leakage through will then trigger the immune system to react. Here is a review paper from the journal Nutrients 2022. To paraphrase, leaky gut allows food allergens to penetrate through the intestinal barrier and stimulate the immune system. A stimulated immune system releases inflammatory cytokines, which further worsen leaky gut. So essentially, it's this cycle one can become stuck in, which is you eat a food, that food causes inflammation, that inflammation causes damage, and you're stuck in this self-perpetuating cycle, which thankfully, with the right changes, can be interrupted and healed. And imbalances in the microbiota can contribute directly to leaky gut, but they can also cause an over-fermentation of the food that you eat. So especially if you notice certain foods lead to prolonged fullness, bloating, pain, pressure, and either loose bowels or constipation, it could be that a problem is occurring in the microbiota. And by the way, if this has been helpful, please comment and subscribe. Curious to hear what you think, and this way you will also see future videos from us. Now coming to the microbiota, there's really two components or or two ways in which imbalances in the microbiota can form using a general heuristic here. The first is dysbiosis, meaning the bacteria and other life-like fungus are askew. They're not appropriately balanced. And to quote a additional review paper of 2020, several studies have found that individuals with food allergies have dysbiosis. So a clear connection between the two. And then another imbalance that can occur is an overgrowth known as SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And to quote a different review paper from 2017, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth produces a number of toxic compounds such as endotoxin, this is what leaks through, that causes gastrointestinal inflammation and therefore damages the brush border enzymes. So we've established that leaky gut and imbalances in the microbiota can 
one cause leakage, can two cause dysbiosis, three can damage the enzymes, and four can lead to inflammation and a sort of self-perpetuating cascade. The treatments, if they're successful, will heal leaky gut, reduce the leakage, improve enzyme release, and also balance the microbiota. So with that in mind, let's go to the best treatments. The first would be dietary. Now, I want to be careful to distinguish that the right dietary changes should be temporary and then allow you to tolerate more foods over time because the goal is to not have the food reactivity, not to avoid a food in perpetuity, but perhaps avoid a food for a term, heal, improve tolerance, and then be able to eat a broader diet. The first study here just to showcase would be one in NCGS, non-celiac gluten sensitive. So people who are not diagnosable as celiac, but still notice an aversion to gluten. And this was a clinical trial that had people avoid gluten and by so doing, demonstrated reductions in zonulin, a marker of leaky gut, a reduction in gut symptoms, and also coming back to the systemic and inflammatory perspective, reductions in fatigue, anxiety, and joint pain. I want to come back to reintroducing gluten in a moment, but first, bear in mind that gluten is not the only potential trigger. Dairy, soy, nuts, seeds, and shellfish are probably the most common. So continuing with that, another dietary change to consider outside of an elimination diet is a low FODMAP diet. This observational study from 2023 had people follow a low FODMAP diet, I'll define that in a moment, and they found a significant reduction in gastrointestinal symptoms. And the key point here is that after one to two months, more than 50% of the foods, so more than half of the foods they cut out, they were able to reintroduce with no problem. Now, the low FODMAP diet is a diet that restricts foods, namely carbohydrates, that are rich in prebiotics, which feed bacteria. And by so doing, by so reducing, you will combat overgrowth and dysbiosis and also combat leaky gut. And when you do this, just like this study demonstrated, you can then heal and have improved food tolerance, which connects us back to gluten. Gluten is also a high FODMAP food. One concern that I have is far more people are avoiding gluten than actually have a reaction to it. They see improvements in gluten in the short term, in part due to the high FODMAP or the high prebiotic content. But then they assume, well, I can never consume gluten. And this is very discordant with the data. Many studies have looked at this and they find on average a three to 5% prevalence of the population with non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So these are people who may need to avoid gluten forever. But even within this small subset, which is only, let's say, 5%, some of those people will have intolerance to the FODMAPs they're in. And as this study we just outlined demonstrates, people can improve their tolerance over time. I mention this just so as to equip you with the ability to understand what foods work for you and what foods don't work for you. Because avoiding a food forever just based upon faith or fear is not a good practice. We should be reintroducing to tolerance. If you notice a symptomatic aversion, discontinue. If not, then there's no need to restrict any food that might theoretically be a problem. And regarding resources, we have for you a paleo diet elimination template as one starting point for elimination, also a low FODMAP diet template. And remember again, to reintroduce after a few months. And if things are going the way that they should, you should notice improved food tolerance over time. Now, there are other things that we can do to potentiate the healing. And these involve lifestyle changes. I just wanted to in brief share with you this one study that looked at individuals who had high levels of stress versus those with normal levels of stress. And they exposed the monocytes, the, the immune cells in the blood to LPS, a component that leaks through when someone has leaky gut. And they found fairly consistently that those with higher stress had higher levels of reactivity as measured by various inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, and interleukin-8. 
So what this tells us is that stress can actually contribute to how much your immune system reacts. And there's probably a evolutionary component to this. When we were under a lot of stress, that signaled danger, and therefore the immune system should also be upregulated. But modern day, if we're just having the stress without sort of the, um, let's say, immune component of that, like maybe getting cut and then needing to have the immune system at the ready, this is when we can start to develop intolerances to food. So if you are stressed, then doing things to mitigate that stress can be quite helpful. There's one study here in particular I found fascinating. Simply by walking after meals, so something that could be stress relieving, especially if you walk in nature, there was a fairly remarkable improvement in bloating. In fact, when they compared the walking group against a group that took a medication designed to treat bloating, those simply taking the walk had better improvements in their bloating. So don't forget about walking. And there are some data, namely from a 2022 meta-analysis here, that have found that things like exercise may improve IBS symptoms. So gas, bloating, and digestion, abdominal pain, and altered bowel function. The findings here are a little bit inconsistent, but I think it's pretty safe to say that if you're not at least walking and hopefully also exercising, you should do so as a simple and very beneficial stress mitigating technique. So item one is dietary changes, item two are lifestyle changes, and then item three are probiotics. And regarding probiotics, I'd like to lead with my recommendation, which is to use one of these three probiotic types. And we'll come to some studies here in a moment, but I just want to give you this framework. If you look broadly at the research literature on probiotics, you see most formulas are either a blend of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, or they are a healthy fungus, Saccharomyces boulardii, or they are a soil-based probiotic. This includes typically things like bacillus, enterococcus, and streptococcus. And the doses are between one in 10 billion for the lacto and bifido blends, although higher is okay, and between 10 and 15 for the Saccharomyces boulardii, and between two and six billion for the soil-based. So with that in mind, let's look at a few research studies demonstrating that probiotic supplementation can improve food reactivity. The first study is a randomized control trial, and they found that a elimination diet paired with probiotics was more effective in reducing symptoms and food reactivity than just a elimination diet alone. So ideally, we would compare the two. And they used a bifidobacterium blend probiotic at a dose of 1 billion CFU per day. Now, another study was a meta-analysis. So in this case, it summarized 20 different clinical trials. And I'll quote here, Probiotic supplementation significantly improved food allergy symptoms when compared to placebo. They used a blend of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, so the type we just covered a moment ago, at a dose anywhere between 1 and 15 billion per day. Because remember, they looked at 20 different clinical trials with slightly different formulas and different dosages, but still demonstrated the aggregate finding of improvements in food allergy or food reactivity. And then the final study here, a 2023 meta-analysis summarizing 12 studies, quoting, the administration of probiotics was effective at improving adult lactose intolerance. And they used anywhere from 1 to 100 billion CFU per day. And this brings me back to the protocol recommendations for probiotics that we've developed as we're summarizing all this literature. The lactobacillus and bifidobacterium blend type, this is what we outlined in the studies a moment ago, anywhere from one to 10 billion, but higher is okay because the last study used up to 100 billion. This just gives you a general dosing range to target. Now, some people may have trialed this type of probiotic and for whatever reason, it didn't sit well. And so because of this, this is why we include the other two types so that you have the ability to personalize a probiotic protocol to your system. And that's where you have the Saccharomyces boulardii, or the soil-based probiotics, again, at a dose of 10 to 15 billion or two to 6 billion respectively. Now, moving on to the other component that you can utilize is antimicrobial therapy. This could be an antibiotic or an herbal equivalent, something like oil of oregano. 
Now, hang on a second. I thought antibiotics were part of how we could get into this mess. Well, it depends. If someone is using antibiotics early in life, that is when they tend to be the most deleterious. However, there's fairly good data showing a minimal effect on the adult microbiota. It's not a hall pass to use antibiotics indiscriminately, but it is a showcase that antibiotics in people with digestive symptoms, especially a localized antibiotic known as rifaximin or zyfaxin, has merit. And this is why rifaximin, aka zyfaxin, is FDA approved for the symptoms of IBS. Now, if you're not comfortable with an antibiotic, there's also herbal options, again, like oregano, caprylic acid. There's also artemisinin. And what these compounds will do is act in a similar fashion as antibiotics. And there are pretty compelling data either for herbal or for pharmaceuticals to reduce inflammation and also to combat either SIBO or dysbiosis. And remember, if we target this, if we target the dysbiosis and the SIBO, we end up having the downstream effect of correcting the source of the food allergies. Now, I just wanted to close with a quick note about food allergy testing. As it pertains not to the life-threatening IgE allergies, but more so food intolerance and food sensitivity testing, technically. This is not something that I would advise. Usually, these labs are using what's known as IgG testing, and multiple bodies in allergy and immunology are all in agreement that the IgG testing for food intolerances and sensitivities is not accurate and therefore should not be used. And I'll just quote, a position paper from the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, the presence of specific IgG antibodies to food is a marker of exposure and tolerance to a food expected in normal, healthy adults and children. The inappropriate use of this test only increases the likelihood of false diagnosis being made, resulting in unnecessary dietary restrictions. So, Again, careful to delineate, we're not talking about the anaphylactic, potentially life-threatening true allergy, but we're talking about the food sensitivity and intolerance testing, and this is one type of testing that I would recommend avoiding. Again, always checking with your doctor, but sadly, some in the field of integrative and functional medicine are using testing that the science does not support. So with all that being said, remember that food reactivity can cause many symptoms. And there is a lot that you can do to improve this food reactivity by reducing leaky gut, healing the lining of your gut, and balancing your microbiota. The main tools here are dietary, either elimination or low FODMAP, lifestyle, stress, walking, and exercise, probiotics, as we discussed a moment ago, and also if all else of those are not sufficient to improve your reactivity, then finally consider antimicrobial therapy. Be careful about the testing. And also remember that with time, your tolerance will improve. So a day uh, or on day one, if you don't tolerate a food, on day 30, 60, 90, 120, you should see a gradual improvement in your ability to tolerate foods over time. Okay, guys, hope this helps. I'll talk to you next time. 